we're in uh, part three of our study together, looking at a very provocative portion of scripture. Man, it's exciting, I got to tell you. You know, this is a non-denominational church, which uh, you all come from various backgrounds, various denominational persuasions, and you would be shocked, or maybe not, to find out that in this first service today, there are those of you who have a certain view of Romans chapter 9 that is 180 degrees different than others standing around you uh, because of how you were brought up in a denominational persuasion. Well, let's let the Bible speak for itself. And let's let the Bible speak in its totality. Because God didn't give us his word to confuse us, but to make things more clear. And this is a powerful chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Wow. We're talking about the sovereignty of God. And again, this is part three of a message titled, The Choice Isn't Yours, with a question there on the end. I'll read verse one, if you'll pick it up nice and loud in verse two. I tell the truth in Christ. This is Paul speaking. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow for continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. For the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who, listen to this, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Yeah, don't forget that. Verse 6 is powerful. Nor are they all children because they are the seed or descendants genetically of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac. And here's a parenthetical insert for the children not yet being born. Remember this. Having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Father, give us ears to hear. Father, may we be focused today. We ask you, Lord God, that every word would be propelled by your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Lord, shine the truth and the light of your word into our souls we pray in Jesus' name, and again, all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated, church family, and um, very powerful, very powerful words. And from this argument is the title, The Choice Is It Yours? It's deliberately put that way. There will be those in one camp that it's saying that God is sovereign, and yes, he is. But they view God's sovereignty in such a way that God has pre-programmed all things to go a certain way, and that is how it's going to be, and it's, it's done. Today's done, tomorrow's done, the forever is done. And then there are those who say, well, yes, we agree with the sovereignty of God, and we do agree with predestination as a biblical doctrine, but we would say that the word foreknowledge precedes the word predestination. And that is true in the Bible. And so God does know everything, and God is sovereign. But in God's sovereignty, with life being lived out in our moment, does he not know all things before they happen? Yes, that's foreknowledge. Based on God's foreknowledge, does he not then go to work in the lives of people and our nations? Yes. Now, this study is going to bring us down to a very bedrock area, and that is, do we understand the nature of God? You have got to understand the totality of God's nature from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible requires this of us to know 
the God in whom we love and whom we worship and serve. I gave you this before. I know it's been a few weeks, but I'll give it to you again. When we talk about the choice, is it yours? I want you to write this down or remember this. Uh, the choice is yours. But where did you get the ability to choose? I just want to lay that out to you. Um, yes, God is sovereign. But does God hold man responsible for his choices? Hmm. Is it possible for a sovereign God who's the creator of all and everything? Is it possible that he could create within the human being one who is created in his image? That is, our moral likeness resembles God's. That is, uh, we're different than angels. I think you know that by now, right? In a lot of ways. You say, oh, I'd love to be an angel. No, you wouldn't. Read your Bible carefully. The Bible says in the day of judgment, you and I will be the ones judging angels. Wow. So the, apparently you and I have got a, we got a big makeover coming. <laughs> We're going to be so much like Christ in the resurrection that we'll be judging the ministry of angels in eternity. Wow. But the truth of the matter is God created us, humans, in his own image. Is it possible then that God in his creation engineered within the human being a level of sovereignty where a human can choose not only what they're going to have for lunch today or breakfast, but what they would do with the gospel when presented to them? Now that causes a silence to fall upon this sanctuary, and I get it. But let me put this out to you right now. I believe that God, and it is my opinion, that God has built within us the ability to have sovereignty to a level, meaning you can only have a consistent Bible, in my view, of heaven and hell, whereby God gets all the praise and the worship and the glory for having provided us a heaven, having provided us salvation, having provided us Christ who went to the cross and rose again from the dead, that when the invitation to accept Christ arrives, that God gives us the ability to choose. It's all to God. Amen to that? Amen. To God be the glory. We will not enter heaven saying, wow, I'm so glad I chose all this. Are you kidding? You and I will walk into heaven and then probably fall flat on our face in absolute awe and wonder at the grace and the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me here. Thank you, Lord, for getting me here. In the same token, those who inherit hell... If God was eeny, meeny, miny, mo, sending people to hell, then they would be walking around hell saying that God is unfair. I really wanted to go to heaven, but he didn't let me in. Or I had no choice about it. I don't believe that. Wherever predestination based on foreknowledge appears in the Bible, it is always in the favor of God's love toward those who believe. And whenever you read about hell and those that are there, they're responsible for not having accepted Christ. Joshua put it this way. Am I yelling? I'm so excited about what I'm talking about. <laughs> Joshua put it this way. <laughs> Joshua said, for you, Israel, make up your mind. Are you going to serve these gods of your pagan fathers that worship Baal and Ashtoreth and all these pagan deities? Or are you going to worship Yahweh? Choose today whom you shall serve. If God determined in advance those who would go to hell based upon his choosing, then what was Joshua talking about? You see, I believe those that are in hell today are in hell because they chose to go there and they're responsible for being there. And that's what makes hell justifiable in their rejection of so great a salvation. I hope that makes sense. I hope so. So church family, writing these down, if you would, and we'll jump back into our series, The Sovereignty of God is, a, is Predicted and Predicated Upon the Love of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 says, just as he chose us in him, watch this, just as he chose us in him, just as God the Father chose us in Christ, when? Before the foundation of the world, before time began. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons 
by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You should say amen to that. That if you're here today and you love the Lord Jesus or you're here today because you're curious about the things of God, I just want you to know that before the universe was ever created, God has a plan based on his foreknowledge that he puts into his predestination work. And you're here because God has brought you here. You're watching right now because God has put it within your heart to tune in. And this cannot be spoken about without considering the omniscience of God. Omniscience. It's a big word. Uh, Its meaning is bigger. The omniscience of God is that the God of the Bible knows all things. Watch this. He knows all things and he knows all things in the now. He lives in the eternal now. That means he's never learned anything. Watch this. You're living today on the calendar, but to God, this day with you in it on the calendar has always been in front of him for all eternity. That'll freak you out. Tomorrow? Oh, well, we'll find out about what tomorrow holds. Guess what? He has eternally, forever known what tomorrow holds. That ought to deal with your fret and your worry pretty amazing. His omniscience, he knows everything. And uh, somebody will come up after service and say, so I'll, I'll tell you right now, somebody will say, yeah, well, what about this? If God knows everything, if I choose to go right, then, make, then, then I change my mind and I go left. Did God know that? He not only knew that, he knows what happens if you go right, and he knows what happens if you go left, even if you never go left. It's called in theology decree, not degree, like the temperature decree. The decree of God is that he knows all things actual and all things possible. We have no idea the depth of his wisdom and knowledge, his omniscience. The all-knowing God is the God of the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, he speaks to Jeremiah, I knew you. Oh my gosh, how big is your God? My God's big enough. That he knew Jack, me. I mean, it's not that he didn't know Jack. He knew Jack (laughs) in my mother's womb. He knew you in your mother's womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations, God told Jeremiah. And by the way, he told him that when he was a teenager. Jeremiah was called to serve God as a teenager. Can you imagine? Your teens, our teens have no excuses. (laughs) Jeremiah was a prophet to the nation at a young age. And God says, don't tell me what you can and cannot do. I knew you from your mother's womb. Again, Joshua 24, 15, I quoted it earlier. Joshua said, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in those land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a beautiful choice that Joshua made. Once again, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 tells us, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Translation, God does good stuff. God does good things. Everything that God does is predicated upon his omniscience, but also this is that he's an all-loving God. And remember this. I've I've dialed down on this several times uh, in these three uh, parts of this message. It's going back to a criteria, to a standard that must never be forgotten. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 29. For whom he foreknew, key, he also predestined, you see that? To be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. I'll leave you with this comfort, and that is not... You don't have two of those or three of those. You have all of those if you are God's child. So we saw this church last time. We saw this, that in verses 1 through 5, that the choice is it yours. We saw that there's the scope of God's sovereignty. 
very quickly. Number one, that includes sorrow, grief for the lost. You read it a moment ago that Paul was pleading with God like Moses did. Oh God, I wish myself accursed. Moses says, remove my name from your book, God, if it's going to help get the children of Israel into heaven. That's, listen, that's love. But God doesn't deal like that. God didn't say, okay, Moses, okay, Paul, you're right. That would make man an associate to redemption. And man won't do that, or God won't do that. Listen, I don't want to upset anybody, but there's a cult that believes that if they get your name, they can go be baptized in your name and save you. That makes them little saviors. That's not biblical. In fact, it's anathema. But notice that Paul is sorrowing over the condition, watch this, listen carefully, over the condition of his brethren, Israel, the Israelites, for having rejected the gospel. Listen, nationally, when Jesus came, and we studied it just a couple weeks ago on Palm Sunday, he presented himself as king, right? What did the nation do? The nation rejected him. But in the national rejection of God, weren't there Jews that were saved? Yes. Listen, I believe that our nation has rejected God. I believe that America has turned its back on God. And you're seeing more and more in the news every day the evidence of that by the decision-making process of our leaders They have forsaken God. Well, how do you know? Because they have forsaken God's nation, Israel. God specifically goes through the Bible, Old and New Testament, and he judges nations that refuse to come to the nation of Israel's aid. But listen, even though right now the nation of Israel is a nation in unbelief, are there not Israelites who are true children of Abraham who love the Lord Jesus? Absolutely. So remember this. There's national judgment. And listen, there is personal judgment. A nation can be judged and yet individuals can be saved. Israel was taken into captivity. But Daniel was a man who loved the Lord. You need to remember that. America is probably, has seen its best days. And what is ahead of us is probably the righteous judgment of God. That doesn't mean that your family or your life is going to be judged. As a believer, our judgment took place at the cross. And so this nation as a whole, Israel as a whole, they were lost. And Paul wept over them. In verses 3 and 4, we learned that it involves the love and the compassion and mercy. Where he called out and he interceded for them. And then in verses 4 and 5, we saw that it incorporates the full counsel of God. Everybody listen up on this. Genesis to Revelation. There's a lot of people right now. Listen, if you don't know this, I'll tell you and then you can go look at it later. The church, watch my air quotes. The church in America is greatly divided right now over the issue of Israel and among other things. But it's going to widen even more. Friends, listen, churches are going to divide over the issue of Israel. You want to know why? There are those who say God's done with Israel. They're, they're not legit. They're, they're uh, wrong. They don't need to exist. God, they rejected Christ, and so God rejected them, and it's all over. Then there are those who say, this is what we say, God revealed himself to the Jews. You read it a moment ago. To them he gave the prophets, the fathers, the scriptures, and Christ himself according to the DNA, the Jews. But because of their national rejection of the Messiah, God pressed pause And the gospel went to the ends of the earth and all around the globe that the Gentiles might be saved. And if you understand the totality of scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is crystal clear that not only will God restore the nation of Israel in the future, but before he restores them, he will draw them back from all the four corners of the earth into their own land. I ask you if that's happened. Then he said he would begin to open their eyes. Their eyes are beginning to open. But according to the Bible, war is coming to Israel. And then their eyes will be really opened to the Lord being their God. And you'll see more and more. or We'll we'll read more and more of that. And then ultimately, God cannot be done with Israel because the Messiah, Christ Jesus, returns to Jerusalem to set up his kingdom. If God is done with Israel and the Jew, then Jesus ain't coming back. 
I say that with incredible confidence and sarcasm. Of course he's coming back. And the Bible says he's coming back to the city of Jerusalem to sit on the throne of David and the nation of Israel. So people, read the Bible in totality. And don't listen to what people tell you, including me. You search it out in Scripture. Church, this is where we left off, is this, in verses 6 through 9, the security of God's sovereignty. We saw the security of his sovereign word. It says in verse 6, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. God's word's not going to fail, ever. His word doesn't fail. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. I'll make it relevant. Everybody who goes to church doesn't mean they're all going to go to heaven. Everyone who calls himself Christian are not Christians. We know that. Apply that same logic. It is true. Not everyone who claims to be Israel are Israel. Verse 7, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Just because they have the DNA of Abraham's uh, mark in their blood doesn't make them a believer. doesn't make them having access to heaven. This is a shock right now. We've got Jewish people turning their TV off right now because I just said that. I'm going to heaven because I don't have to believe. I'm a child of Abraham. Uh, listen, how can you be a child of Abraham when Abraham believed in the Messiah and Jesus himself said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced? Amen. No, for you to be a true child of Abraham, you must believe in the God of Abraham Amen. and the scriptures that God gave. But if you're looking to works and to external things to get you into heaven, you have fallen from the grace of God. We also learn this, that the security of his sovereign promise, verse 8, that is that those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Wow, just that front end, children of the flesh. Go read uh, Galatians chapter 5 and 6. Yikes. Who are the children of the flesh? Well, you can read in Galatians and see their attributes. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Who are those that really belong to God? Are those who love God, those who live out the will of God, those who yield to God? And so what we claim to be with our mouth can only be confirmed by our life and by our lifestyle and by our actions. Who are the children of the flesh? You might want to write these down, possibly, if it speaks to you at all. And it's, this is a brief analysis. There are those who are earthly-minded. They just live for this world. A friend of mine this last week, I found out, uh, is worth tremendous amounts of millions and millions of dollars, and he made every penny on his own. Worked himself through school, poor, lived, grew up in a poor home, made everything on his own and was, uh, and well, is, was successful until he found out this week that his business partner for decades just robbed him of everything. And, and you'll, you'll see it in the news. It's that big of a deal because it involves many, many things. And uh, cleaned him out. You claim to be a Christian and you pillage people? You claim to be a Christian and you rob, you cheat, you steal? Not according to God. It doesn't matter what we say what we are. It's what we are and how we live that backs up what we say. The, listen, the just shall live by faith, the Bible says. Notice, it's the just. It's that they've been justified by their faith in God, but because they've been justified by their faith in God, they live for God. Think about this. Now, I look, I'm not dumb. I know that if the rapture happens tomorrow, this church is going to be packed on Sunday. You know that? Not all of us. Look, I want every single one of you to go to heaven. But I know that there are those sitting among us just statistically that are like, I'm here because my husband wants me here. I'm here because my wife wants me here. I just suffer through this because that's what they want. 
or I'll believe what I'm going to believe, and I don't care what the Bible says. You, friend, church, you have no idea the stuff we hear as pastors week in, week out. It'll blow your mind. I just told the pastors before service some drama that had been going on, and I told the pastors, I said, you know what? You need to thank God that I'm not Jesus. Because if I was Jesus, I wouldn't come back for this. You want to know about the grace of God? He's coming back for us. That's grace. Wow, that's amazing. They're earthly minded. Also, they are recognizable over time. That's what we're living through now in our world. Over time, we're finding out what people are really made of. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 35, for their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. These tough days are starting to expose what we're made of. Listen, I predict something. I'm not a prophet, but I predict something. God is getting his bride ready for the big day. And that means, listen... The downside to that, think about it. In a natural wedding in this world, the bride and groom, they're running around, they're scurrying about, they're, they make sure as they get ready for the wedding, she's all stressed and sweaty, and he's all freaking out, and their, their emotions are being stressed, and, and all that tension. And what's fun for me as the old guy who's been through all this stuff before, I get to tell them, can you just calm down and give all of these responsibilities to somebody else. I want you to enjoy this engagement up until your wedding day. Lay it on your family. Lay it on your friends. I always tell her, don't you have any uh, bridesmaids? Yes. Use them. <laughs> have them go get the stuff and do that and paint this and put sparkles on that and get the, f <laughs> have them do that. You just need to, but right now in the world right now, the church is getting ready to meet Jesus and he's the one getting her ready. And I say that to say this. Your life and my life are being stretched. We're in the pressure cooker right now. You can feel it. Your life is being scrunched. Is that a word, scrunched? Crunched, squished, crunched, and scrunched. We're being, we can feel the pressure. I feel it. You feel it. God is preparing. He's not destroying you. He's preparing you. He's, listen, right now, let's be honest. The things of this world... Like the, song, like the old hymn, are growing strangely dim. Things that used to get me excited or even things before that used to be a temptation, now it's like, that's a joke. Get out of my face. Right? Because this world has got no taste anymore in our mouth if you're a child of God. Also, their pride is showing. They're proud of themselves. They might be proud of their religion. They're self-dependent. They are comfortable with their lifestyle, whatever it is. They just write it off and say, God, God hasn't done anything about it. He's, he's good with it. What about those who are the children of God? Children of God are fixated and mindful about heaven. Heaven's real. It's actually there. We're going to it. We need to think about heaven more. They also recognize and are recognizable over time. They're not proud of themselves, but of God. Don't you make you sick? I make me sick. You're not my problem. I am my problem. Only a Christian knows what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> We're very wary of religious things, legalism, things like that. Being dependent upon a person or a group rather than on Jesus. We're God dependent, are we not? And we're only comfortable in a lifestyle that we know pleases God. The Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, 
We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's heaven, friends. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's born through your mom, and the Spirit that is born of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You got to be, listen, you got to be born twice to enter heaven. Born into this world, you've been given life. Born again a second time is how you're born into the family of God. I think it's a. Uh, Dr. Gray Barnhouse that says, and I'll probably flub it up, but it goes something like this. The Bible tells us that if we're born twice, we only have to die once. But if we're only born once, we have to die twice. Because if you're only born into this world, you suffer a spiritual or physical death, and then you suffer a spiritual death. But if you're born into this world, and then you're born again into the family of God, then you only die a physical death. And that's easy, apparently, to the equation of God. Wow. But he goes on. He speaks to the great Nicodemus, the great scholar of Israel. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. I kind of see verse 7 with Nicodemus' jaw hanging down. He was the great scholar, by the way, of Israel. He's the one that knew all the scriptures. And this shouldn't have been a surprise because according to Jeremiah 31 and according to Ezekiel 36, Nicodemus knew those passages. And in those passages is the born-again doctrine. And Jesus held Nicodemus responsible to know his Bible. But it's God who keeps his promises. No one else is able. The security of his sovereign promise is that God keeps his promises. I don't know much in this world anymore, but I hang on to God's promises because he's faithful. And listen, did God make Israel promises that he said are unconditional and forever? Yes. Yes. Then be wary and watch out for those who say that God is done. He's not done with Israel. But the believer's genealogical record, if I might put it that way, is uh, what I would call a one-hit wonder. (laughs) There's a band, I'm not going to give you their name. They're not famous for any other song but one song, way back in the 80s. But if the song came on today, you'd say, oh, I like that song. And, um, but they only had one hit. One hit. That's all they needed. They retired. <laughs> Guess what, friend? You only have one hit. Our salvation in Christ Jesus is a one-hit wonder. Nothing else needs to come after it. Nothing else needs to fill in the gap. Nothing else needs to provide. And here it goes. It's this way. In John chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. What a sad statement. Verse 11, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. That's the Jewish nation. But as many as received him. Notice the word as many. Do you think that as many applies to Jew or Gentile? Who? Good for you. All, both, everybody. Anyone, everyone. But as many as received him, to them gave uh, he the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Friend, have you been born of God? If you have, you know it. If you're not sure, you haven't. It's that simple. God's not playing a a guessing game. He's not moving, you know, the ping pong around with the ball, you know, the cup on top of the ping pong, and guess which one's in it, and if you guess the right one, you'll go to heaven. He's not doing that. If anything, God puts, he either puts three cups out there with three ping pong balls in the cup, or he just gives you one cup with one ping pong ball in it. And then he says, pick. (laughs) He makes it simple. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not a human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? 
Has he ever promised and not carried it through? I love that. Thirdly, under this point, everybody, is this, is the security of his sovereign acts. God's sovereign acts. What he does. God's sovereign actions. Verse 9. And for this, uh, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. That's what God spoke to Abraham and to Sarah. Genesis 18, 25, the Bible tells us, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? When God told Sarah and Abraham they're going to have a child, God, listen, this is hard for us to handle in our day and age where words don't seem to matter anymore. When God says something, he's bound to it. Now, he's not worried about that because he only speaks truth. That's all he can do is speak truth. He's perfect. But just know this. God who is perfect, what he has spoken, he must perform. So when you come to a promise in the Bible, God wants you to circle it, highlight it, write your name next to it, photocopy it, take a picture of it, email it to yourself, get a t-shirt made of it, but immerse yourself in it. When you read the Bible and this verse jumps out at you or this passage jumps out at you and ministers to you, grab onto it with claws. And it happens like this. You're reading and reading and life has got its issues and you're going through your thing. And then that verse jumps out. That's it. Grab it. Here's what you do. You grab it and pray. Pray that verse. And then say, God, I, you, you spoke this to me. I didn't make this up. God, you gave me this. I didn't write this book. You gave it to me. And God, I'm hanging on to this promise. I don't see it. I don't feel it. But you said it. And God, I'm going to grab it and hang on to that. And he's faithful. The sovereignty of God's promises. When God says he acts and he's going to act, he's going to do it. He's awesome. And you can be bold about that very truth. Sarah, imagine Sarah, the woman, the wife. She's amazing. You know, we pick on her because she, she caved in. I get it. She, get, she got impatient. But let's be honest. I can't even say she got impatient, even though the Bible says she got impatient. You guys, years went by. God made the promise, and years went by. So she's thinking, look, can you imagine? She looks in the mirror. If I'm wrinkled this bad on the outside, <laughs> I ain't having no baby. <laughs> Looks like God needs help. <laughs> Abraham, yes, sweetie, I want you to take my maid, Hagar. You sleep with her, and then we'll adopt the kid, and I'll, I'll catch the baby, and then it'll be like ours. Abraham, the great man of faith that he was, said, all right. That, by the way, was the greatest mistake since Adam and Eve. You know, there's war in the Middle East right now because of Abraham. Well, I, well, it, I mean, Sarah too. It was her dumb idea. But then Abraham, I'm right on it. She whiz, really? But the truth of God's incredible sovereign acts, that God moves and he does all things right. And I love that as we quoted in Genesis 18, that was Abraham saying, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Think about the context of when God was going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. We do not know the exact pin drop location, but we know the vicinity in southern Israel. You can go to the region. You can drive around it. You can't say this is the spot, but you can say within this 10 square mile area, this was the spot. It is the most cursed looking soil on the earth. The, nobody goes there except Christians to point out this is where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. You can't plant a weed there. It will not grow. 
And the Bible says that it was absolutely like Eden. And when you read the judgment of God, the Hebrew word means that the judgment came from under, under the earth and up, and it came from the sky and fell down from above. Those aberrant, perverted cultures of Sodom and Gomorrah were caught between the firestorm of God's wrath and judgment. And Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Do you have a hard time with that? I understand that. I believe God has a harder time with it than anybody. But God is holy and just. And when God judges evil, he's holy and pure. Friends, you will not wag your finger at God if God chooses to humble America for what America has done to Israel this week. You will not say, why is this happening? If God shakes this nation, the believer who knows their Bible will say, Lord, have mercy in your holy, righteous judgment. Have mercy upon us, O God. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. He is sovereign, and his actions are absolutely holy. His sovereign act, as we're talking about, selecting electing, choosing, the fact that his promise would come through Sarah, not Hagar, but through Sarah, was all based on his sovereign foreknowledge. And I'm wondering how you respond to this invitation. Listen carefully. We're going to run through these fast. God is sovereign. And yet, listen to this. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to me, Jesus said. I believe God built within you the decision of choice. Matthew 19, 14. Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me, come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that's refreshing. John 6, verse 65. Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Predestination. Based on foreknowledge. John 7, 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And then I just wrote this in my notes. I just called it a self-test. John 5 verse 40. Very sad. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. He said that to the Pharisees. Listen, friends, again. If God has not sovereignly built into us the ability to choose, then what is Jesus talking about in John 5.40? He says to them, you're not willing to come to me and be saved. Who's responsible for that? God provided, are, are you guys with me? God provided the way of salvation. They rejected it. And Jesus says, you're not willing. That implies that they could be willing you say, Jack, that's blowing my mind. Yes, but with God's foreknowledge, he knows everything all at once. Isn't it amazing that in this room, God knows those who are going to enter into heaven on that day and those who are going to enter into hell on that day? And then thirdly, we look at this, and this is our final uh, uh, argument here, is in verses 10 through 11, uh, the choice, is it yours? And we're looking at the faithfulness of God's sovereignty, the faithfulness of God's sovereignty. And it is this, that God is sovereign with his calling. This gets, uh, this gets kind of fun because uh, it gets into family stuff. And I don't know if you've ever felt bad about your family. Oh, my family, we need help. You, know, you want encouragement? Read about the families in the Bible. <laughs> what a bunch of messed up families. <laughs> but God, listen, I think I heard Joel Rosenberg recently say he's Jewish, and he said, 
uh, my people, the Jews. He said, uh, you ought to read the Bible if you don't know the Bible. He said, uh, all of our laundry, all of our family laundry has been aired out in front of the world. It's found in the Bible. And boy, is that true. Uh, you know the Jews didn't write the Bible just for fun, because if they did, they're, they're quite crazy. They made themselves look really bad if they wanted to make themselves look good. God wrote the Bible. Amen. And the Jews are still his chosen people. The nation is in unbelief right now, exactly as the prophet said. Some Jews ha- are opening their eyes more now than in the last 2,000 years. It's epic of what's happening. But the Bible says, just wait, there's going to be a lot more that open up their eyes. And I mentioned Ezekiel before we got the study going, but the book of Ezekiel, chapters uh, 37, 38, and 39, tells you that when the Ezekiel battle happens, that the eyes of Israel will be opened to see that he is Jehovah God. But I say to you this morning is that God's sovereign calling is here for us to enjoy. Look at verses 10 through 12. And not only this, But when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even our father Isaac. Why does it say one man? Because he's the God of Abraham, who? Isaac and Jacob, exactly. That's all that that's stressing right there. Rebekah didn't have another husband or somebody on the side when it says when she conceived by one man. It's Isaac. He's the man. For the children not yet being born. So pregnant within Rebekah is Jacob and Esau. They're not even born yet, nor having done any good or evil. See, you and I are stuck on what we see in the moment. The kids haven't even been born yet. They're in the womb. They haven't done any good or any evil. Here's the point, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. That's a statement of fact because God has foreknowledge. Write it in your margins. This is based on foreknowledge. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. You can almost hear, you know, 45 record. I said this before and I'm going to say it again. When it, when it just goes, in the Jewish mind right now, it just goes, that's not possible, not possible. The older is to never serve the younger. The younger always serves the older. The older is firstborn. The firstborn has all of the rights, all of the ownership, all of the glory. This is true. This is true. But God has, in his word, interrupted his own plot on these things because he is sovereign. Without violating his word, this is what he can do. And by the way, you want to write this down. It's happened several times in scripture where God has the Younger preside over the older. Uh, Joseph. Remember Joseph? What about this? In the case of Judah, he was not the oldest son of Leah. Reuben was the oldest son in Genesis 49, but Judah's the one that's selected. Hey, what about David? You don't know anything about David's brothers, or very little. David was the baby in the family. David turned out to be the king of Israel. the youngest. It's up to God's calling, friends. It's what he decides. And the faithfulness of God's sovereignty is seen this way, that his calling is placed upon you, upon me. God calls. You might say, well, Jack, how do I know of God's calling? That's a great question. God has his sovereign purposes that he's going to achieve and fulfill And God is desiring to do that through those who believe in him. If you say today, I believe in him, friend, you just set yourself out from among the rest of the world. Listen, maybe it's best some of you not say that anymore unless you know it for sure. Because if we say, I know God, Now we are out away from the crowd. We have identified with God, which means now everyone has the opportunity to watch your life and see your life to see if you are truly a child of God. 
That shouldn't make you nervous. It should make you, what's the old King James word? It should make you be circumspect. Anybody know what that word means anymore? That's right. Walk straight. To be straight up. To walk straight. Circumspect. Because God called me. He's called me to be his child. You see where this comes down to. It doesn't come down to this battle between sovereignty, man, sovereignty, God, choice, this, the other. It comes down to, do you love God? Do you love God? Do you want to love God? That has come from God. We love him because he first loved us. And he's calling you, or he has called you. And it's irregardless of birth order, rank, status, ethnicity. What an awesome thing. You think about that. Secondly, under this, and this is where we'll end is in verse 13, is God is sovereign in his love. His love is sovereign. Boy, I'm grateful for this. It says in verse 13, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau have I hated. Does that bother you? If you don't know your Bible, that bothers you. It's like, man, this is going to be for a loop here. It's okay, calm down. (laughs) This was not spoken. Notice this. Paul is writing this down here in the book of Romans. But listen, this is from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Watch this. You say, what does that matter? Let's read this verse. Because um, you guys... Jacob and Esau had been born before Malachi, the prophet, was ever born. Are you all listening? Before he was ever born, Malachi was ever born, Jacob and Esau had been conceived, born, lived their lives, and died, and had been dead for hundreds of years before this was ever said. Now are you tracking? I thought that would really, I thought that would have wowed you for a moment. Because I think you're thinking that God... Oh, the, uh, out, comes, out comes Esau, uh, I hate him. Out comes Jacob, I love him. That's not how it happened. Can I put it this way? In carnal terms, I don't mean sinful, but in, in, earthly speaking, this is God's review of the two lives of the men, Esau and Jacob, long after they had lived their lives and had entered into eternity. Then God delivers his assessment. Is that okay? Everybody got that? I think I lost you a long time ago. (laughs) I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? This is God speaking to Israel. God says, I loved you. They say to him, in what way? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Yeah, yeah says the Lord, yet Jacob I I have loved, but Esau I have hated. God is saying to the nation, in these two boys are nations. Esau, from him came the Edomites. A completely, listen, listen, this is so important. Jacob is one of the founding fathers of Israel. In fact, his name will later be changed to Israel himself. The Israelites come from Jacob. The Edomites come from Esau. What's amazing is, did they share, listen carefully, unlike unlike Isaac and Ishmael, they shared the same dad but different moms. Right? Right? Jacob and Esau, they share the same dad and the same mom. Are you hearing me? These are true twins. But God is telling us that he has known from all eternity. And then hundreds of years later tells us, I've loved Jacob. Esau, I have hated. It's all based upon what these two boys chose in life before they passed away. Are you hearing me? God didn't make Esau unlovable. 
Esau made himself unlovable. And let's be honest, when you read your Bible, Esau is not so much of a stinker. Who's the stinker? Jacob is a stinker. If you and I knew Jacob and Esau, you and I would probably like Esau better than Jacob. In fact, here's what we would do. We would say, you know what? Take your wallet. Here comes Jacob. Put your wallet in your front pocket. (laughs) But listen, do you know why God says I love Jacob? Oh, man, I, I I pray that the Lord gets this across to all of us. It's so profoundly factual that God is not determining heaven and hell or blessings or cursings based upon a person's performance. Because if that were the case, Jacob and Esau both would be wiped off the face of the planet. Jacob in his rebellion, listen, is, am, I speaking of, am I speaking to you right now? Jacob in his rebellion, Jacob in his stubbornness, Jacob in his, in his, you name it, had a heart for God. The man turned to God, struggled with God, wrestled with God, cried out to God, had faith in God. Esau, Esau, the moment the moment Esau was hungry, came, come in, comes in from the field, Jacob, was a, he was always in the kitchen with his mom. Jacob and Rebecca, Jacob was a, a dainty dude. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. It says, uh, it says Esau was a man of the field and Jacob was a man of the, of the house, of the kitchen. It doesn't mean he was gay or anything, it's just that he had his... He had, his own, he had his own cooking show. How's that? He was just tender. He was just a, he's a mama's boy. And he's cooking and he learned how. He knew how to cook an amazing stew. His stew was so amazing. And Esau comes in. You could just see Esau come in. He's rugged. He's a man's man. He's dragging behind him a dead deer or something. Jacob, I'm starving. I'm about ready to die. Really? (laughs) And uh, I'd like you to make me some of that amazing stew you make. And Jacob goes, what will you give me for the stew? You see this, kid? Don't tell anybody, but our grandson, our youngest grandson, he's he's like Jacob. He's, He's like this big, but he's like, wait, we're doing here and we're going there? What's in it for me? <laughs> I'm serious. That little guy walks into a room, doesn't say anything to anybody. He just goes like this. He sizes everybody up <laughs> automatically. And then he looks for the exits. He knows exactly. He, he's... We have to hope he's never elected to public office. <laughs> He'll be a great Navy SEAL. But... but Jacob says, what, uh, what do I get for it? Now, that stinks, right? He's your brother for crying out loud. He's so hungry. Now, I think Esau's exaggerating. If I don't eat something, I'm going to die. Come on, you can eat a fig. There's a falafel. While it's cooking, you can have some shawarma. (laughs) Come on. you're right. It's not like he's in the jungle somewhere or the desert. And his brother says, "Uh, what are you going to give me for it? And what does Esau Esau winds up a grain. I'll give you my birthright for some soup. This is the key. I will sell out the most precious, valuable thing that I own if I could just have a cup of soup. And God says, Esau, have I hated? I've hated Esau for that. Do you see now? God's hatred is holy, not our like our hatred. God said, you know what? Jacob, the conniver that is, he was, by the way, his name, J- Jacob, his name means heel catcher or supplanter. His, his actual name means crook. <laughs> but he's got a heart for me. Esau, 
He will sell out the precious things of God at the drop of a hat. He'll say that he believes me, and the moment pressure comes, he caves. Do you see the difference now, everybody? God didn't hate Esau because God had it out for Esau. Esau wanted nothing to do with God. And he proved it by what he was living out. I will take my birthright that to a Jew is it for a cup of soup. He held the things of God irreverently, without value. And his end was destruction. Jacob struggled with life. Wound up in the end having a profound heart for God. May we check our hearts to make sure we are for real. In this time of trial, church family, be still and know that he is God. If the, listen, if the ocean roars and the mountains are removed and cast into the sea, Stand still and see the salvation of God. Don't panic. Don't make a dumb decision. If you don't know if you should go to the left or to the right, stand still. And the pressures, the ideas, the words, the thoughts that are now invading your heart and your mind and your family, don't give them, as Paul said, we would not give false teachers one hour of opportunity. Don't give those crazy temptations and attacks one hour, one moment. The Lord is coming. The earth is shaking. Jesus is on his throne and you and I will be tempted and pressured to cave in on our commitment with God. Don't do it. I would shout today as Moses did to the children of Israel, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then God said to Moses, yeah, that's fine. But Moses, tell the people to cross over. And I'm saying to you, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But right now, every single one of us need to make sure we cross over and have our feet seated upon faith. Father, we look to you, almighty God, king of the universe. Everybody's pulling strings. They're doing this. This nation is threatening that. This war posture, sable rattling here, economic peril there. Oh, my goodness. Lord, it would be about uh, us losing heart if we didn't know that you were on your throne. Oh, my goodness. You see what's going on in the globe? And everything's falling right into place. You're God. You're king. And every believer in this nation and beyond We need to just lean into you more, press into you more. Greater is he that is in us than he and it and whatever is in this world. We praise you, almighty God, and may we live for your glory. And Lord, may we walk in your joy because right now people are heavy hearted and we need to be out there with joy, telling them, yep, it's a crazy world, isn't it? Getting crazier, but Jesus is on his throne. Do you know Jesus, my friend? Lord God, we praise you. We love you, Lord. Cause us to love you more. By your grace, we will hang on to you. By your faithfulness and sovereignty, you will hang on to us.